we have a crisis in the world, tremendous crisis, and also crisis in our consciousness, in us. I see the urgency of change, radical revolution, mutation in the mind. I see it. It is necessary. There is complete quietness of the mind, and that which is silent has vast space. Only then that which is nameless comes into being. This is Urgency of Change, the Krishnamurti podcast. When the mind sees that thought is the creator of illusions, you have an insight into the whole nature of illusion. It is that insight that dissolves all illusion. Hello and welcome to episode 206 of Urgency of Change. Each episode of the Krishnamurti podcast features carefully selected clips from our extensive archives. The aim is to represent different aspects of Krishnamurti's radical approach to many of the issues and questions we all face in our lives. This week's theme is illusion. Upcoming themes are virtue, division and evolution. This is a podcast from Krishnamurti Foundation Trust, based at Brockwood Park in the UK, which is also home to the Krishnamurti Retreat Centre. Situated in the beautiful countryside of the South Downs National Park, the Krishnamurti Centre offers retreats individually and in groups. The focus is on inquiry in light of Krishnamurti's teachings. Please visit krishnamurticentre.org.uk for more information. You can also find our regular quotes and videos on Instagram, TikTok and Facebook at Krishnamurti Foundation Trust. If you enjoyed the podcast, please leave a review or rating on your podcast app, which helps our visibility. This week's episode on illusion has three sections. This first extract is from Krishnamurti's third talk in Sanan, 1979, titled Security in Illusion. But we are trying to get up to find out why human beings hold on to illusions, which are obvious to another. Now, is it, as we said, gives them a great sense of superiority? Ah, I've had something which you fellows haven't had. That's the whole gamut of the gurus. You know this. I know you don't know. And why do human beings live in this way? Why do you or X live this way? Please think it out with, let's think it over together. Because your experience is personal, enclosing, self-centered, and the another is the same. So there is always, your experience is different from mine or another, and mine is better than yours, so there is always this division going on. So are we, in thinking this out together, holding on to our experiences, our beliefs, our ideals, our conclusions, knowing that they are merely verbal structure, knowing that they are merely a thing that's gone, finished, in the past. Why do we hold on? Is it we, are, we want to live in a certain, with certain illusions, which, in which we take delight. The 
So the security lie in illusions. You know? Apparently, the vast majority of people in the world like to live in illusions, whether it's scientific illusions, or the religious illusions, or economic illusions, or national illusions. They seem to like it. And are we, perhaps we are serious, not wanting mere entertainment? We are deeply concerned with the, with the social structure, which is destructive, dangerous, and we human beings say we must bring about a different quality of mind and a different society. So we are asking, why do we find security in illusions? It's very in, please find out. And why is it that we cannot possibly face facts? Say, for instance, envy is common law to all mankind. Right? Envy being comparison, measurement from what I am, what you are, this measurement. Now, in thinking over together, why is it not possible to end that completely? I'm asking, I'm not saying it should or should not. <coughs> The, the fact is the reaction which we call envy. That's the fact. But the non-fact is I should not be envious. Right? I wonder if you, do we meet this? The fact of this reaction which we call envy is what is happening. But the mind has projected the concept that one should not be, which is unreal. So you are struggling to move from the fact into non-fact. I wonder if you see all this. Right, sir? Are we meeting each other? Whereas, to face the fact, Without the non fact. Are we meeting? I don't know. Are we all tired this morning? So, we have been so trained, educated to accept non facts as being far more important than the actual. And in the non-fact, we think we shall have found security. Right? Now, do you, when you hear that, is it an idea, a concept, or you are really listening, and therefore you see the non-fact and finish with it? I wonder if you see this. Right? So we have to go into the question. <coughs> what does it mean to listen? You have listened. Now, 
for nearly half an hour. Have you listened actually for half an hour to what is being said? Which is what you are saying to yourself, not what is another is saying. Right? Are you listening so completely you see the illusion actually and see the absurdity of living in an illusion and finish with it? Which means, can we stay with the fact and not have no relationship to non fact? Because our minds, as we said, is conditioned to non facts. Just see what we have done. The other day, a man said to me, <coughs> I can't bury my son in the Campo Santo, what is it, in the uh, cemetery, because he's not baptized. You understand? You understand what I'm saying? Not baptized. Not, I don't, you know, going through the, all that nonsense. And he was horrified, miserable, unhappy that he, his son couldn't be buried there, in the holy ground, as he called it. You follow? Just, no, please, sir, this is very serious. You may, may laugh at it, you may set it aside because it's, that's nonsense. But you have your own nonsense. So can we here observe so closely, so attentively, give all our attention to this, and therefore all illusion has gone? And this illusion is part of our conditioning. If you are a Catholic, look at the illusions you have. Or Hindu and so on and so on, you don't have to go into it. Now, a mind that has sought security in non-fact has dropped that, uh, has discovered there is no security there, then what is, please follow this, what is the state of the mind that is observing what is happening, the actual? You understand my question? Have I made my question clear? Do please. All right, suppose I have not, oh, it's finished. I, do, I have no illusions, which doesn't mean I'm cynical, which doesn't mean I'm indifferent, or I have become bitter, but illusions no longer play a part in my life. Then I ask myself, what is the quality of the mind, your mind, together, what is the quality of our minds which is facing that which is happening. Do you understand my question? You understand my question, sir? Huh? What is the state of your mind that is freed from all kinds of illusion? National illusion? Scientific illusions, of course, all the absurdity, absurd illusions of religions, and your own, the illusion that you have been carrying <coughs> as your own experience, 
right? What is the quality of a mind that is, that is free? It is only such a mind can, that can observe what is happening, naturally. You follow this? Now the question then is, the mind is seeking security, right? It wants security. It has not found security in any illusion, right? But yet it says, I must have security. I wonder if you are following all this. So it says, I must find security in my relationship. Obviously. I have let go of the beliefs, the ideals, oh, I am tired of <laughs> the, <laughs> the experiences, the remembrances, all the nationalistic nonsense, all that, they are all gone. <coughs> but my mind is not, one's mind is not free from the idea of security. And from that may be the beginning of all fear. So it says, is there security in my relationship with another? Go on, you are, you are, you are the people who are <laughs> caught in this, so is there security? in the image I have created about my wife, or my husband, my girl? Obviously not, because that image is the projection of past experience, right? And the past experience has brought about this image, and according to that image I act, which is the future. You've Right? Am I making this awfully difficult? So I've, the mind is now saying there is no security in any form of image. Right? Not in relationship, but in any form of having an image which thought has created from the past experience. Right? So if you have not an image, then what is relationship in which the mind is still seeking security, right? You. I oh, will come on, sir. Is there a relationship between two people when they are not absolutely thinking together? In thinking together, there is complete security. Right? That is, one has let go all his opinions, judgments, experiences, all that, and the other has also. So they can think together. Right? That is the actual relationship in which there is no division, as my personal thinking and yours. Right? So we are saying, <coughs> there is security, psychologically, total security, when the mind is freed from all illusions. And 
doesn't seek security in any form of relationship as attachment. Right? Does the attachment is one of the uh, illusions in which we, see, we think we'll find security. I'm attached to you. I'm attached to this audience. I come here, the speaker comes here and wants to talk, express himself, fulfil himself. And therefore find certain security in that. Which is, the speaker is exploiting you for his own security. And when the speaker is honest and fairly decent, he says, What rot it is, and he moves away from that kind of nonsense. So, in attachment, we want to find security. And when you don't find in a particular attachment, you try to find it in another attachment. One is married to one for twenty years, and you're bored, and you suddenly <laughs> run off with somebody else, which is what is happening in this society, and <coughs> there you are hoping to find some kind of security, excitement, sex and all the rest of it. See what we are doing, sirs. Or you are attached to your, to your present lady or man and are satisfied. Right? Which is another security. I wonder if you see all this. I wonder if you see how your mind is playing tricks on yourself all the time. This is called love. So we are saying, is there security at all, psychologically? So think it out. I have invested, one has invested psychological desire for psychological security in belief, in ideal, <coughs> in experience, in remembrances, in attachment, in God, and so on, so on, so on. And is there security? Or it's all illusion. I mean, one can have tremendous comfort in a, any kind of illusion that Jesus is going to save you. Marvelous comfort, save you from what? God knows, but doesn't matter. And so on and on and on. The Hindus have it, the Buddhists. The same pattern is repeated throughout the world. Which means we never face the fact, but rather live in non-fact. And when we do that, our minds are torn apart, right? We become very cruel. We think conflict is inevitable, it's part of life. When you put aside all that, now how do you put aside all that? That's the point. You understand? You have listened to, to, the, to this for three quarters now, and In what manner, if you have discovered the, 
your particular illusion, in what manner have you set it aside? You understand? Please follow this. <coughs> Is it an act of determination Is it an act of choice, saying, this is illusion, I prefer that? Is it an outcome of somebody else's concept imposed upon you? Is it your own clarity of observation? That is, you yourself see it. Then the question arises, how do you see it? You are following all this? You are not getting tired? One sees one has caught in an illusion, an ideal. How do you see this phenomena? Is it a reasoned out conclusion, a clarity of verbal explanation? Is it that you are being skillfully persuaded? <laughs> or you yourself? See this fact. Now we are asking, how do you see it? Do you see it merely as visual perception, the facts in the world? And therefore, from visual perception, <coughs> reading books, newspapers, magazines, discussing, you have come to the realization that ideals are rubbish. That is merely an intellectual process, and therefore it is merely a, you are living in a concept, and therefore non fact. However, logically, sanely, rationally, you may observe it and then say, well, I'll drop it. But the dropping of it is not actual, because you have other illusions around the corner. But whereas we are saying, please listen to this, if you observe Without any remembrance in your observation, I must make this clear, otherwise you will think I am crazy. We're, we are discuss, talking over together the question of seeing, whether you have come to the conclusion that illusions are nonsensical and therefore you won't be involved in them. Or do you have an insight to the whole movement of illusion? You understand my question? I can take, one can take one kind of illusion, belief, investigate it, go into it, and say, well, I, it's finished. And you that investigate your ideals, and so on, so on, so on. That doesn't really free you. 
Does it? Investigate that. Does it really free you when you have <coughs> rationally, logically, sanely investigated into the various forms of illusions? Which means, how do you investigate? You investigate through thought. Right? Thought has created these illusions. And with thought you are examining these illusions, which again is a trick you are playing. So thought can again create other illusions. You say, well, I won't have these illusions. But thought has not understood the very nature of illusion and the creator of illusions. Now, if you see, thought itself is the creator of illusions. You are following all this? Uh, then, <coughs> when the mind itself sees that thought is the creator of illusions, then you have an insight into the whole nature of illusions. It is that insight that is going to dissolve all illusions. I wonder if you have got it. Should we discuss what, or go into the question of insight? Hmm? We have got seven minutes. <laughs> <coughs> So, insight is not intuition. Intuition may be a refined form of desire. Don't accept what the speaker is saying, investigate it. <coughs> Intuition or apprehension may be the unconscious projection which is taken as something extraordinary, real. Right? So we are saying insight is not related to any form of desire. I want to understand. I must go into this. The, this, the, behind, the motive behind this, desire wanting to comprehend. Right? Desire saying, this, I must find this out. So uh, this is, if you want to go into it very carefully, Insight is not the activity of desire. Insight is not <coughs> the projection of past experience. Insight is not a remembered action. That is, I'm going to show you something. That is, when you see that all religious organizations instantly, not logically, step by step, which you can do afterwards, if you see that all religious organizations are based upon thought and therefore have nothing whatsoever to do with actual uh, the sacredness of religion, you have an insight into it. You understand what I'm saying? Now, is your action <coughs> the action of insight with regard to illusion? You understand my question? Or is you are still analyzing it? You are still mentally 
active in the in exploration. Or you see instantly the nature of illusion and finished. You are following the difference? One is determination, choice, a subtle form of conclusion and action. So action takes an interval, there is time interval. We are saying in insight there is immediate perception and action, in which there is no regret, no turning back. It is so. Have you got this? Don't, sir, this is, if you want to go into this, one has to be very careful not to deceive yourself. Because our minds are so quick in their capacity to deceive. I can see, yes, I've got insight into this. And out of that insight you act. And then you find, I wish I hadn't done that. Regrets, you follow, all the sequence follow. But insight is something entirely different. There is no time interval between insight and action. They are both together. Now, after explaining all this, we are, which is a verbal form of communication, <coughs> and have you listened so carefully that you see instantly the whole structure of illusion? That is wisdom. The second extract is from the second question and answer meeting in Ohio, 1980, titled Freedom from Any Form of Illusion. How would you find out if there is such thing as truth which is absolute, which is not relative, which is complete, which is never changing under climate, personal opinions uh, and so on? How will you find, how do you, how does your mind, the intellect, find out? Or thought find out? You, may we go on with this? Does it interest you all this? I wonder why. <laughs> because when you are inquiring into something that demands a great deal of investigation, action in daily life, a sense of putting aside which is not, which is false. That's the only way to proceed, right? That is, if we have an illusion, a fantasy, an image, a romantic concept of truth or love and all the rest of it, those are the very barriers that prevent moving further. Can one honestly investigate what is an illusion? Is the, does the mind <coughs> live in illusion? Or do we have illusions about people, about nations, about God, about religion, about everything? You follow? How is how are illusions coming to being? I wonder if you follow me. How do does one have an illusion? What is the root of it?
what do we mean by the word illusion? It comes from the word Latin and so on, from ludere, which means to play. The root meaning of that word is to play. Ludere. Which means playing with something which is not actual. You understand? The actual is what is happening. Whether it is what may be called good, bad, and and so on. What is actually taking place. And when one is incapable of facing what is actually taking place in oneself, then to escape from that is to create illusion. I want, right? We are. Um, please don't agree. I'm just exploring this. We are exploring together. The word illusion implies to play with something that's not actual. Luther. I won't go into all the Greek and Latin meaning of it. So, and also in Sanskrit, it's a very same words are used. So, if one is unwilling or afraid or wants to avoid what is actually going on, that very avoidance creates the illusion, a fantasy, a a romantic movement away from what is. If we accept that, as the meaning of that word illusion, moving away from what is. Right? Can we go on from... No, please don't agree with me. See, this is a fact. Then, can we avoid this movement, this escape from actuality, So then we ask, what is the actual? Right, you are following? The actual is that which is happening, which is the responses, the ideas, actually. The actual belief you have, the actual opinion you have. And to face them is not to create illusion, right? Can we go in our investigation? Have we gone that far? Right? Because otherwise you can't go further. So we so as long as there are illusions, opinions, are perceptions based on the avoidance of what is, then that must be relative. Right? Right, so I want to go on. Relativeness, which is I won't go into the word relative, that's the word no I won't, sorry. Is can only take place when there is a movement away from the fact the what is happening. What is in understanding what is it is not your personal opinion that judges what is. It's not your personal perception, but actual observation of what is. One cannot observe what is actually going on 
if you say, my belief dictates the observation, my conditioning dictates the observation, then it is avoidance of what the understanding of what is. I wonder if you got it. Right? Are we doing this? Actually do it. See that perceive what is actual, your actual belief, your actual sense of dependency, your actual competitiveness, and not move away from it, observe it. That observation is not personal, right? But if you make it personal, that is, I must, I must not, I must be better than that, then it becomes personal and therefore it becomes relative. Whereas if we could look at it, at what is actually taking place, then there is complete avoidance of any form of illusion. Right? Can we do this? You may agree to this verbally, but can we actually perceive our dependency, right? Either a dependency on a person, on a belief, on an ideal, or on some experience which has given you a great deal of excitement and all the rest of it, and therefore depend on those, that dependence will inevitably create illusion. So can we observe the fact that we are dependent and observe it? Right? So in the same way, we are going to find out if there is such a thing as absolute truth, if you are interested in this. Because this has been asked not only by some casual questioner, but by monks who have given their life to this, you understand? By philosophers, by every religious person up who is not institutionalized, deeply concerned with life, with reality and truth, you understand? So if you if you are really concerned about what is the truth, one has to go into it very, very deeply. First of all, one has to understand what is reality, right? What is reality? That which you perceive, that which you touch, that which you taste, right? That which you have pain, and so on. So. Reality is the sensation and the reaction to that sensation, the response to the sensation as an idea, right? And that idea created by thought. So there is thought has created reality. The marvellous architecture, the great cathedrals of the world, the temples, the mosques, and the idols that are put in it, the images, all created by thought. And we say that is reality, because you can touch it. You can taste it, you can smell it. 
So we are seeing all the things that thought has created. Understand? The knowledge, the acquisition of knowledge through science, through mathematics, and so on, so on, is reality. But nature is not created by thought. Right? You are following this? The tree, the mountains, the rivers, the waters, the deer, the snake is not created by thought. It is there. But out of the tree we make a chair that is created by thought. Right? So there is thought has created the actual world in which we live, and nature includes in by you know the whole that is not created by thought, obviously. Then you are we ask is truth reality? Instead, you are following this? One perceives that thought has created the world in which we live, but thought has not created the universe. But thought can inquire into the universe, the cosmology, astrophysicists, they, that is, they are proceeding through the through they are proceeding the inquiry with thought, and they will come to certain conclusions, certain hypotheses. Try to prove those hypotheses, always in the in the path of thought. I don't know if you follow all this. No, this is hmm? so. Thought is is relative, and therefore whatever it creates, in whatever direction it moves, it must be re- relative. It must be limited. You are following all this? Please, this is not a lecture. <laughs> I am not a professor, thank God. Hmm? We are just inquiring, as two human beings, desire, wanting to find out what his actual truth is. <coughs> if there is such thing as that. So the mind is no longer an illusion. That's the first thing. Has no hypothesis. Has no hallucinations, illusions. It doesn't want to grasp something or create. An experience which it calls true, which most people do. So the mind has now brought order into it. Right? Right, sir? There is order. There is no confusion about illusions, about delusions, hallucinations, about experience, so the mind, the brain, has lost its capacity to create illusions. Right? Then what is true? That is, sir, what is the relationship between reality, hmm? you understand reality, what we explain, what is reality, and that which has no, uh, that which is not created by thought. Is there such thing which is not the product of thought? You understand? 
<laughs> Can we go on with this? That is, is your mind, our minds now, sitting here in rather depressed <laughs> climate, under trees rather cool, is our mind, are our minds free from every form of illusion? Right? Otherwise you cannot possibly find out the other. Which means is your mind has your mind completely free of any confusion. Therefore, it's, it, it is absolute order. You find, is it? You understand my question? How can a confused mind, disorderly mind, mind that is in a turmoil, ever find what his truth is? It can invent, it can say there is truth or there is no truth. But for a mind that is, that has sense of absolute order, a mind that is completely free from every form of illusion, then it can proceed to find out. You understand my Otherwise you can't, obviously. That is, uh, look, there is something rather interesting, if you are interested in it. The astrophysicist scientists are using thought to find out, going out. You understand? They are doing this. They are investigating the world around them, matter, and going beyond the astrophysics, beyond, but always moving outward. Right? But if you start inward, the me is also matter. Right? Thought is matter. So the, if you if you can go inwards, then the, the, you are moving from fact to fact. Right? I wonder if you see all this. Therefore, what you do, that which is beyond matter, you begin to discover. The final extract in this episode is from Krishnamurti's seventh talk in Sanan, 1963, titled A Brain Without Illusion or Fear. We do not know, we do not want to know, we do not want to find out what death is. We want to continue in the know. If my brother's son dies, wife dies, I am miserable, lonely, self-pitying, which I call sorrow. And I live in that messy, confused, miserable existence, which I call life. And I divide life from death, because life I know, the life of quarrels, bitterness, despair, disappointment, the frustrations, the humiliations, the insults, the g all that I know. And death I don't know, so I divide. and believe 
dogma satisfies me till I die. And that's what for most of us takes place. Now, if when you can understand this whole process of continuity which thought gives, and you see the shallowness of it. It is quite shallow. It is nothing mysterious, nothing extraordinary and noble. Then you function like mechanically where thought is necessary. unemotionally, unsentimentally, clearly, logically, sanely, without this constant urge to fulfill, to be somebody. If, when that is clearly understood, then you will know how to live in the present. Then the living in the present is dying. Now when that is clear, you can then inquire, you can, your mind then, being unafraid, without any illusion, you understand, that is absolutely necessary, without any illusion. An illusion exists only as long as there is fear. When there is no fear, there is no illusion. An illusion exists when, the, when that fear has taken root in security, in some form of security, whether in a particular relationship, in a house, in a belief, in a position, prestige, fear. gives illusion. And as long as that fear exists, every form of illusion will continue. And what that illusion you cannot possibly understand what death is. And we are going to inquire what death is. At least I'll inquire, I'll expose it, but you can only understand it, live with it completely, know the deep, full significance when there is not fear and illusion, which means that you are living so completely in the present, not functioning mechanically in a habit of memory. Because we're not concerned about reincarnation, whether you live or don't live, it's all so trivial. That we have understood the triviality of the demand to continue, which is merely the process of thinking. the machine that can continue. When you see that, you see the utter shallowness, stupidity, triviality of such a demand, whether I continue after death, who cares? And what do you continue? What do you want to continue? Your pleasures, your dreams, your hopes, your despairs, your joys, your property, the name that you have, the little character, and the knowledge which is information acquired but through your particular petty little life or added to it by professors, by literary people, by artists. Is that all you have? That's what you want to consider. Well, 
Now, when you have finished with all that, and you have to finish, you have to finish all that surgically, like a surgeon operates with a knife. Then the brain is without illusion and fear it can observe. Whether you are old or young doesn't matter. Then you can observe and understand what death is. Fear exists because of what, of the desire to hold on to what is known. The known is the past, living in the present, modifying the future, tomorrow. That is our life, day after day, year after year, till we die. How can such a brain or a mind understand something which has no time? Which has no motive? Which is something totally unknown? Do you understand? Death is unknown. You have ideas about it, how to avoid it, or how to recognize it is inevitable, rationalize it, or have a belief that will give you some comfort, hope. But a, a mind, a mature mind, without fear, illusion, without this stupid search for self-expression and continuity, such, a, such maturity can then look and find out what death is. And it can only find out what death is if it knows how to live in the present. Do you understand? Please follow this, how it can live in the present, not with despair, because there is no hope in the future. Therefore it says, I'm, that today is not for me. No. Can it avoid? Nor does it avoid the past and the future, but and therefore blind itself to. Nor does it avoid the past and the future. But because it has understood the past, its total consciousness, which is the collective, which is not only the individual but the whole. Therefore there is no me and the separate, the many. In understanding consciousness you have understood the particular as well as the collective. Therefore you got rid of the caste, snobism, social prestige, all that is completely gone for a man who lives in the present. And that is dying to everything known. Then you will find, if you have gone anywhere that far, that death and life are not something separate.
because you are living. You are living totally, completely in the present. So completely attentive, without choice, without effort. Therefore, living is dying. Because what is continuity can never be created. It's only that which ends knows what it is to create. Because life and death as love is creation. Because then you are, there is that state of the unknown. You understand? Because death is the unknown as truth and love and creation. Then you will find a mind that is so completely mature that is not thinking in terms of time, is dying every minute because it's living in that present every minute. And you will find then the mind is always empty. And from that emptiness you look, you observe, you breathe, you understand. And to live like that means dying to everything that you have known every minute of the day.